Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World, the Practical Voice Podcast. This week's episode of VUX World is brought to you by Botmock. Now, do check Botmock out. I've been talking about it all year so far and a little bit last year. If you are using any other tool or if you're not using any tools at the moment, any software to design voice experiences, we've heard and we will hear rather in this episode about how important it is to prototype your experience before you even get to a technical build, before you even get to an alpha, prototyping and testing your early concepts is so important because it saves you a whole load of headaches later on down the line. If you've, if, Especially if you're doing things like recording audio and you're getting voice actors in to record audio, if you're creating an immersive audio experience like we're going to talk about today, then you need a tool that will enable you to prototype quickly, rapidly and test things and also to collaborate with your team it really does make huge sense because you're going to store up problems later on if you don't do that and to fix them later on takes a lot more time and it's a lot more expensive so do check botmock out b-o-t-m-o-c-k dot com slash v-u-x world for a free trial okay google talk to hidden cities Hidden Cities Berlin from the Financial Times is an interactive audio experience where you get to choose which side of Berlin you want to hear. From the clubs, maybe two hours past, maybe 15 or 20 hours past, to the lakes. We prefer most of the Berliners to swim naked. Explore Hidden Cities Berlin by asking your Google Assistant, OK Google. Talk to Hidden Cities. This week's episode of VUX World is such an interesting episode. You might have seen the Hidden Cities Berlin Google Action launched at the back end of last year. So some of you might have had a play with it, you might have interacted with it. Today, we're going behind the scenes. Hidden Cities Berlin goes behind the scenes on Berlin. We're going behind the scenes on the behind the scenes of Berlin (laughs) today. We're speaking to the people behind the skill, behind the action rather, and we're going to get really into detail about the design process, about the brief, about how they approached it and about the technical solutions that were delivered to create it. And there's more to it than you think. There always is with this kind of stuff. We're speaking to Nikki Birch, Michelle Feuerlicht and Nigel James Brown. What a name. We are getting into detail into the design side of things and into the technical side of things. It's the first time that an experience like this has been created for any voice first platform. Immersive interactive documentaries. It's in collaboration with Google and the Financial Times. And we're getting right into detail on how it was created right here on VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. Branding with the big faces. I love listening to it. Kane Sims. Kane Sims. Kane Sims, the one and only. Britain's finest, Mr. Kane Sims. Dustin. Dustin. Dustin Coates. I like it when you guys are together and talking about boys. Without further ado, welcome to the show. Okay, well, Nikki, Michelle, and Nigel, welcome to VUX World. Hi. Hello. 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 I will. I'll. I'll uh, we'll go down one by one because I think. Well, I, in fact, I made the same mistake there, which I've also made in the past, where I'll just say hello to everyone, and then everyone just kind of shouts at the same time, and it, it's a, it's a bit of madness. So let's start from from the beginning. We'll we'll start with you, Nikki. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background and and how you kind of got into voice? Sure. Yeah. Um. My name's Nikki Birch, and uh, currently I have two jobs. I run a company called Rosina Sound, and I also work for BBC Research and Development, which is my main job at the moment. Um, and I work on voice devices there, or content for um, voice devices. Um, but I'm here to talk about the work that we've done uh, with Rosina Sound, which is the company that I have founded. Um, so my background is in radio and audio specifically. I've spent years kind of making radio programs and developing radio ideas for BBC and other kind of other streaming services based in the UK. And then I started doing some work with Michelle and Nigel of her previous company um, on audio games. And we worked on kind of binaural audio games uh, and kind of explored this space a bit. And then I um, spent a bit of time kind of thinking, doing some future gazing and consulting around where the future of radio and audio might be going and sort of 
that just happily happened to coincide with when Amazon first released um, the Echo. And I thought, right, I really want to make something on this. This is a really exciting opportunity. And it kind of merges some of the work that I've done um, previously. And so I made something called, um, made a interactive story with BBC Research and Development, but this was through, through the company that I was running, um, called The Inspection Chamber, which is a science fiction um, piece. So you have to open The Inspection Chamber, still available. Um, and it's a 20 minute um, rich, audio rich, um, I, I suppose one might call it interactive narrative where you can explore, you play the one of the roles of one of the characters in the story. And it's, it's not using the synthetic voice, but it's using rich audio. So after that, I kind of thought, this is really exciting space. Um, and we were approached by, um, we'll probably go on to talk a bit about this, but was approached by Google and the Financial Times to work on this project here. So kind of that's my background in a nutshell. And I also make, uh, as I said, content for the BBC via BBC Research and Development. So we've probably been working in voice now for about two, yeah, two years. Cool. A, a veteran by UK standards. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, what about yourself? You had some work at the BBC as well, did you not? Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your background and, and how you got into voice? Yes. So um, I am, well, I'm an interactive and immersive producer. I guess I'd call myself that now, but I've been a digital producer and I've been... Um, uh, a website producer but basically I um, have worked with storytelling and technology um, for the last sort of 15 years so I, I haven't worked at the BBC but I've made a lot of projects for the BBC because I've worked um, for production companies or um, sort of content companies where we uh, make uh, experiences, digital experiences that go alongside TV shows or, or um, BBC brands. Um, so I've done pretty much every kind of digital thing you can imagine. I've done apps and games and websites and VR and uh, I've done social media storytelling. So it's basically... Uh, taking a digital platform and working out how you can tell a story on, on that platform with its inherent kind of constraints or limitations or uh, innovations. Um, so this was actually my first voice um, project, um, but I'd done so many different kinds of um, uh, interactive uh, projects on other platforms that it kind of uh, the skills were kind of um, similar so it was it's all based in sort of UX and agile and iterating and I'd also um, sort of started my career working in newsrooms and as, as a digital journalist so uh, doing a kind of journalism based project was really interesting for me. Wicked and quite I mean Looking at LinkedIn, it looks as though something interesting was going down with the Brit Awards over 2012 to 2015. Broken records year on year for, what, the most tweeted non-sporting UK television event in 2014 and 2015. Yes, yeah. So um, that was a project I did at uh, the company that Nikki mentioned before where we were all working together. And um, I... I was basically handed that account. It was a brand new account they'd won to, to do all the digital strategy um, for the Brit Awards. So how do we engage younger audiences or new audiences in the Brit Awards um, using social mainly? So it was devising how uh, we would use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and what we would do over the full year and how we would um, uh, sort of do the campaign on, on the night of the show. And that's actually, again, where I brought in some of my experience at working newsrooms where I, I kind of treated it like a live news event and had we had producers working across all different platforms and like minute by minute or second by second updates. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's another way you kind of, how do you tell the story of the Brit Awards using digital? Don't forget her BAFTA. Okay, you've got to ask her about the BAFTA. Oh, yes, the BAFTA. Go on. Tell us about the BAFTA. Oh, OK. That, that's for a project I did at uh, something else as well. Um, that was a game. So we did a lot of um, 
as I said, we did a lot of games for the for BBC Children's BBC. And um, one of the games was for uh, the dumping ground, and it was a sort of sim style game where you, uh, which was um, sort of set in the in the dumping ground house. So yeah, that one of children's BAFTA. Wow. And Nigel, looking at your LinkedIn, it looks as though there's a couple of BAFTAs kicking around there as well. <laughs> yes, yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my background is uh, uh, originally working in the games industry, uh, making AAA games for a um, whole variety of publishers. Um, one, of the first, uh, one of the first projects I worked on was uh, uh, Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix Formula One game, uh, and that won a BAFTA uh, for best sports, uh, I think, in the interactive side of things. Uh, and I was also involved in a uh, Doctor Who project that won a Welsh BAFTA um, quite a few years later. Um, <laughs> so, yes, BAFTAs all round, I think. Wow. We're in esteemed company here, Dustin. So how did you get? How did you then get into voice then? If, you know, you, you had a lot of gaming experience. How did you... What, what interested you about voice? How did that come about? Yeah, I've been working in the games industry for, for quite a few years. Uh, I w- went sort of freelance uh, and and worked for just about everybody in the industry in, in some way, shape or form. Um, and um, uh, I ended up working with uh, Michelle and Nikki at a, uh, a content creators and um, working on a whole variety of different projects, uh, games and apps and uh, and other things. And as been previously mentioned, the uh, Papa Sangre. Um, uh, what's the best way of describing it, Nikki? It's a binaural audio adventure or for iOS. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I, I came in to help with the technology in there and uh, uh, stayed there for many years working on lots of different projects. Um, and really, just really quick, uh, you mentioned binaural a couple of times. It's a term I'm not super familiar with. What do you mean by that? Spatialized audio, like you might count. So audio that goes around your head like, um, in all directions. So it's either, it's called lots of different things, 3D audio, binaural audio, spatialized. It, it just means kind of, if you imagine at the cinema, you have this kind of 11.1 sound, but you know, on headphones. Uh, so really an immersive type of experience. Yeah. But for this, for the proper sangre, it was essential that it was spatialized because there were no graphics. So the way you played the game was by moving towards the sounds and working out where the sounds were in your in your kind of constructed room that you couldn't see. So if you imagine now, that's quite commonplace with VR, you know, where the audio is sort of uh, basically has its direction. But at the time, this was just for iOS. Um, you know, this was just on a phone. This was before virtual reality was really kind of popular. So it was it was pretty groundbreaking, actually. Yeah, uh, but my uh, specialism uh, in the games industry has, has always been on the sound side. So you know, I've I've, I've been playing around with uh, surround sound, uh, yeah, pretty much since about two thousand, uh, and sort of music systems uh, before then, probably since about ninety five. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I am a, a bit of an audio veteran, I guess, in the industry. Wow. <laughs> so it's interesting that that you've all got kind of pretty extensive audio based experience, haven't you? That's sort of it's quite unique to come across a set of people who've worked on something who've all got something so much in common. Like typically you would have like a designer from over there and maybe a writer from over there and then someone who's got experience in audio here. But it sounds as though between the three of you you've all kind of come from an audio first kind of background. Does that does that sound about right? Yeah, I suppose if you think my background's in radio specifically and Michelle's has a you know a, a real as she said a really good kind of uh, diverse spread across UX on lots of different platforms and, and Nigel's more in the technical side. So that's probably in a simplistic way, that's how we break it down. Yeah. yeah. Wicked. So let's get into the Hidden Cities uh, Berlin action then. Um, so you've all kind of worked on that. And, and for those listening, what we'll do, as I mentioned in the intro, we, we're kind of going to go through the process of, of what it took to create this. Um, so definitely check it out. I was, I've was, i literally, I've been on there a couple of times over the last few weeks. Uh, and most recently today, I was doing a, a few bits of testing. So it was something that wasn't necessarily, you know, too demanding on my brain. So I kind of had it on in the background and I must have been on there for about 45 minutes. It's really, really good. But for those who haven't tried it yet... Tell us a little bit about the the Hidden Cities Berlin action, what it is uh, and how it come about, first of all. Maybe, Nikki, do you want to give the background on that? 
Okay, I can tell you how it came about, and then perhaps Michelle can go into the details of how it works. Um, so, yeah, I was approached off, off the back of doing Inspection Chamber. I was approached by Google, who were interested in exploring um, some rich audio content, and they were working with some partners at Financial Times. Um, and they basically put us in touch with the Financial Times and said, we want to create, um, we want to create something for the Google Home platform, which is rich and is, um, I suppose, more like a documentary piece and is using the brand Hidden Cities. So they basically gave us those kind of um, th those those um, limitations already, and they said, right, okay, it has to be for brand Hidden Cities because they've done previous work, Hidden Cities Dublin, Hidden Cities London, um, not on the Google um, Assistant. But um, And so at that point, I gathered the team together, um, people I'd worked with previously, and I thought, okay, these are the people we need to make it. And we also had um, some editorial expertise from a company called Reduce Listening um, uh, as well. And we all kind of got together and thought, right, what can we do that fulfills both the F Financial Times um, needs and also challenges and pushes what, what um, is already there on the, what isn't there, in fact, um, uh, on the Google Home platform. Mm. So, Michelle, do you want to kind of explain to those who haven't tried it yet? I'm sure that everyone's uh, got it in their diaries to sort out later on after they've listened to this podcast. But in the meantime, Michelle, do you want to give people a bit of an overview of what Hidden Cities is for those that haven't come across it yet? Yes. Yeah, so it's, um, it's as Nikki said, a collaboration between Google and the FT, and it uh, is essentially an interactive audio documentary um, set in Berlin. Um, and it's the first, I believe, the first interactive audio experience um, uh, documentary of this kind on, on the Google Assistant. And uh, it's, so your host is uh, Guy Chazan, who is uh, the FT's uh, Berlin Bureau Chief. And uh, you are taken on a journey throughout nine different locations in the city um, and at various points uh, in each location, you're given options about what you want to hear or listen to or, um, or who you want to speak to next on your journey. So I guess uh, as a kind of um, summary, it is essentially a choose your own adventure structure. Um, but there are no dead ends and you are sort of taken on a loop through the city um, to discover some interesting and surprising content. Wow. So the, are these stats right then? 125 locations altogether and around about 90 minutes worth of content. Yes. Yeah, so when I when I said locations, I was using the kind of uh, the non the non internal term for locations. So I was talking about different sites around Berlin. So you could go from uh, you know sort of a nightclub to uh, the Schloss. But uh, when we talked about locations internally, they were um, individual uh, sort of audio clips right. within in individual points on the journey uh, in one area. Yes. Right. So five of those, for example, might be in one physical location, if you like, in Berlin. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that you had certainly some constraints. It had to be a Hidden Cities project, had to be Berlin. But what was the brainstorming like? How did you settle upon uh, this approach for the action? Uh, so basically, we had, a, we had a kickoff with everyone. So the FT and Google, um, Rosina Sound and Reduce Listening, who were creating all the audio documentary content. And we sort of went through what everyone's goals were and what the kind of strategy was going to be for the project. Um, and then uh, us, as in Rosina Sound and Reduce Listening, then went to Google and we sort of sat down on their uh, rooftop terrace on a really hot day and plotted out what the possible user experience could be. So we knew, as you said, we had some constraints, we had some sort of creative constraints, um, but then we also had some, you know, budget and time constraints, and then we had some technical constraints, and those were identified pretty early on, which were you could only have uh, two minutes of audio before there had to be an interaction, um, and, uh, you know, some sort of best practice constraints, which are you can't offer 
you can't uh, offer too many options because there's too much cognitive overload. So you have to keep it to like two or three, ideally two options per path. So uh, we sort of sat down and we we came up with this flow and it was uh, a pretty simple flow in the end. It was just a, essentially a circle and within each um, point on the circle, there was other circles so you could go to any particular point on the map at any time so you didn't have to start the action from the very beginning you could start it at the lakes um but once you were on that circle you were traveling in a clockwise direction yeah we like to get like a string of pearls so if you imagine a string of pearls that you can only go one way yeah you can never go back but you can travel around in onto each pearl and then at each pearl there's a lot of variation within there but ultimately you're always traveling in the same direction Okay, so rather than it being a, a kind of the typical kind of flow chart that is often cited, it was more of a spherical kind of thing whereby you know that wherever someone starts off, you're always going to take them down a certain path, but at any point in time, they can hop to another pearl, if they like. Yeah, I guess your, your sort of standard flow chart was actually what happened in each location. So once you got to a location, it was a like, you know, a branching narrative um but the overall flow for the entire experience because there were nine locations so each location was positioned as like a you know basically where you came into the experience that was location one and you traveled around in that direction mm. you mentioned uh, as well you can give too many options you said that you were limiting to what two or three but you've got also these nine different locations so what did you do to to encourage or to provide the user with uh, what they could discover, what they could do within the action? Yes, yeah, so there were two ways. Um, so first of all, the, um, the FT published a map. So there was a physical uh, product that went alongside the action. And um, I guess from their research, they thought that most people would find the action that way. So you could see physically that there were nine locations. But then, of course, when we designed it, we designed it for anyone coming in. So uh, we did. It, we took quite a long time to like work out the best way to do this. And one of the things we did was have a really sort of succinct introduction where Guy uh, sort of trailed the possible locations you could go to. And we had a little bit of um, uh, sort of training or instruction about how you could get to different locations within the experience. Um, and then as we came to the end of designing the entire experience, we uh, then designed the help menu. And that was where if you got stuck, you could go into the help menu and it offered you every single location um, at that point. Okay. So did you, obviously going, just going back to that brief, and you had the session on the rooftop where you were kind of trying to plan out what was what. Were you always going to do a documentary? Was that part of the brief is to do a documentary or was that part of your creative process in deciding to do a documentary style thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was the Hidden Cities brand. So um, they wanted to turn that into an audio experience and um, we were work. So reduced listening, make audio documentaries for the BBC, for example. Um, so, yes, we knew it was going to be an audio documentary where you were going to meet different people. Um, but, yeah, you wanted to get to know the site, uh, the sort of sounds and characters of Berlin. So it was really important. And, in fact, you know, this was one of the kind of rules that came out initially uh, when we started working out what, you know, what every, what our experience had to had to do. And one of them was the story. The story the story had to be good because if you if the story is not interesting people aren't going to listen they're not going to persevere because it's you know it's not a podcast where you know it might get better in a few minutes time it's it's an active experience that you're engaging in or in the um, case of this podcast starting strong and continuing you know we spent a lot of time well so not we the the audio producer Barney, who works for Reduce Listening, is a really experienced um, audio producer, and he, you know, it, it really mattered to him and to us that, that every bit of content was was of value and was telling a story and was really powerful, uh, and it wasn't just kind of meeting someone who had nothing to say, you know. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the themes of the whole piece, and we put that kind of effort that you put into. Um, you know, uh, when you're creating a, a, a radio documentary or any kind of documentary, it was really like, you know, we talked about kind of 
um, is the themes of the piece about changing Berlin. It's a transitional city um, and it's been, you know, changing with refugees coming into the city and lots of startup cultures and, you know, lots of um, new business and like we sort of, you know, so, so it's a changing time. And, um, and so a lot of thought was gone into who we interview, what they're saying and why they're there. And I think that's why it's a documentary rather than just a kind of, here's a load of people talking about a city. Mm. Did you approach this from a, so for example, were you kind of, a, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this, did you approach this from a, we're creating an audio documentary perspective and go through the process that you would typically go through when you're creating an audio documentary? Or did you approach this from a voice first interactive story perspective? That's a really good question because it was a, those were sometimes where some of the rubs happened, right? You know, though that was the challenges you had, um, uh, you were busy, like people who come from the, the radio documentary background and, 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 and and other people who have more expertise in, in the interactive or in voice and, you know, and saying, look, actually, this isn't going to work. We can't do it like this for voice. And, and so it's challenging. And this is what, that's what makes it exciting. That's what makes this kind of a project exciting because how do you make um, interactive documentary? And you can't, one of the things we talked about a lot, didn't we, Michelle, was like, it can't be interactive for interactive sake, you know, and, and you know, it's, and, it, you know, and, and that's why you're always trying to think, okay, um, why are we having this choice here? You know, does it matter? Is it, does it add value to the listener? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I wouldn't, you know, I, I'd say we're still, it's still a kind of a learning experience. And I'd be really interested to hear what people think about that and how, if once they listen to it, how they think this form could be pushed in terms of not just documentary, but kind of long form radio. Because at the moment, or long form audio, at the moment it's, we know it works for gaming, you know, we know it works for kind of commerce, but, you know, in terms of entertainment that isn't just listening to your radio, how are people using voice, you know, um, in, in a different and interesting way? And that's what kind of excites me. And I think a lot of the work that I've done, not just within cities and inspection chamber, but then another piece of work called The Unfortunates, that was an Alexa, is exploring how you can do, how you can use this medium, this new medium, um, uh, in different ways. You talked about not adding interactivity for interactivity's sake, and you also talked about, uh, you know, interviewing people that really had something to say and uh, really provided something to the documentary. Was there ever a concern or did you need to be mindful of interactivity getting in the way of that's the story that the documentary was trying to tell? Yeah. Michelle, do you think so? I think we did. Yes. Um, so the way we we designed it is actually um, probably not the way most documentary makers would design um, their audio documentary. Um, we, we did it all before uh, Barney went out and recorded. Um, so we sat, you know, we defined the editorial subjects with the FT. They were very involved in sort of what the subjects were going to be and who the potential contributors were going to be. And then we sat down and we, we broke it down into, you know, we took out uh, post notes and we broke it down into what each two minute segment was going to be about and what the choices would be um, and how interesting those choices would be, you know, like, would, would you want to, would you want to choose one of those two parts? And, and we had to do that basically before Barney had even interviewed people properly. He'd sort of done preliminary research and he knew a lot about the topics, but, you know, who, we, that's not usually how you would design um, a, a linear documentary. You would sort of just go and get the material and construct the story as it works best rather than sort of constructing the story and then going out and trying to get it to fit. And, of course, we, we changed things as we went, but we had to have that structure before because of the way um, users were going to interact with it. So we had to, if we wanted to have a branch uh, there had to be some sort of sense that it was a continuation of the story in some way. So the person had to mention potentially those two different sides of the story so that when you got to the choice, you knew what that choice was about, what you might hear or, or whatever. Um, um, yeah, so it, it was, so it, it was it very tight, very tight, 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 tight um, But then obviously we, we changed it when, when we got the material and we worked out, for example, that someone had something else to say about um, another area that we hadn't considered. So we would remap constantly. There was a scene where um, 
uh, Barney recorded a lot of people in a park. There's a particular park um, that has is interesting because it's in a kind of, uh, I suppose, gentrifying area. But the park itself is uh, where a lot of people go and um, a lot of the refugees, in fact, go and um, they sell drugs in the park. And that was quite an interesting story. Um, but how you approach that kind of interactively, you know, from a kind of like non-journalistic you know, side, you were like, well, maybe you could see if you could get someone to try and the user to see if they wanted to buy drugs from someone in the park, you know, <laughs> yes or no. And, you know, and then of course you've got the financial times going, that's not ro- what we really want our, um, you know, to represent us. And so, you know, and also can you legitimately go around recording that? Well, no, not really. So it's kind of like, you know, so they they aren't natural bedfellows. There is some tension, and and, and in the end, we, you know, you have to kind of find the compromises. How did you? So, if you were creating a documentary, Michelle, you said there you'd go and get the footage, and then you would come back and kind of construct the story. And if you were kind of going to write a story, then you would you would kind of probably start high level with a sort of beginning, middle, and an end, or what have you. And you would have a narrative and a kind of structure, and even interactive stories. Although you might get choices from you know the Alexa skills, for example, you might get choices, but there's still a defined start point and a defined end point. How did you cope with? ensuring that there was a narrative throughout whilst making it because for example you can go and talk to a property developer over here or actually you can go over this direction and speak to a dj so you can go in completely different directions if you want to so how did you kind of approach making sure that there was some sort of narrative and that it all hangs together well as nikki said we sort of had a, a theme which was sort of transformation um uh, so every location of Berlin had that kind of theme within it. Um, and then each location was, I guess, we saw them as separate. So while they had the same overall theme, they had their own stories within. And then we scripted those stories. So we, you know, literally did it in a Google Doc where we wrote out what people would say and then what how the narrative would work. And then we had Guy, the bureau chief, uh, to introduce it, so to construct, to set up the story at the very beginning and say this is what this location is about, these are the issues, here's the debate or the controversy or, you know, for, you know, for example, the lakes, like here's what, what Berliners do in the summer. Um, and then all the material around it would, would uh, flow into that kind of overall introduction. Hello, I'm Guy Chazan and I'm the Berlin Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. This Hidden Cities Guide is designed to take you inside the most interesting stories happening here. Described by a former mayor as poor but sexy, Berlin used to be known above all for its wild club scene and edgy artistic underground. But these days, it's a lot more than that. Is it worth talking about Caroline at this point? So one of the things we, um, some of the sort of, lessons that I'd learned from previous voice projects is uh, particularly when you're having long bits of rich content is like you'll you get distracted right a listener gets distracted and doesn't really know when they're supposed to interact because uh, and so we we try to mitigate that particularly you've got two minutes of long rich audio content around let's say a, a one of the scenes is in a in a lake and a lot of it's just the noise of people swimming right it's kind of really beautiful but uh you could easily be, you know, going and making a cup of tea at that point and just not really realise when you're supposed to interact. So we, so we decided to have um, a different voice um, to come and kind of be the, the guide of right now is the time you need to do something. Uh, and she sounded very different. She was, uh, she had a German accent and she's quite kind of playful. And, and that really is a sort of trigger to the audience to say, OK, now you need to actually interact. This is when you need to talk. And me, I'm Caroline. I'll be here to help you find your way around. So, this is how it's going to work. All you have to do is listen to the options I give you and then make your choice. There are nine different locations to visit. At any time, if you want to go elsewhere, you can say, move on. And if you need anything at any time, just say, help. And I'll do my best to assist you. That's interesting. That's almost like... I'm sure that some sort of like music producers use that kind of logic, don't they? Where they'll have like a, you know, like a, a breakdown where the song will go quiet a little bit and then it'll come back again and it's a bit louder and it kind of brings your attention back around. That sounds like a similar sort of trait. 
You mean the bridge and the key change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That, you took the words right out of my mouth there. <laughs> so how, how did you decide who to actually interview? So presumably you went across to Berlin. You mentioned that, uh, I forget his name now, uh, Brad, did you say? Roundtree. Yeah. So was he? So did he go to Berlin? And how did you decide who to actually interview for this? So Barney, um, as I said, is a really experienced documentary maker, and he had some. He had a bit of support from the Financial Times, the the Berlin bureau there, and we also had some producers on the ground in Berlin helping. Uh, and then Barney did just did a kind of plain old research, which is like you know what he's really good at, and, and interviewed people and and got the stories and. And, you know, and sort of settled on, there's a story about a castle that's kind of controversial. There's, you know, an interesting story about um, refugees and there's an interesting kind of area said about the park and then, and then about the lake. And he really kind of focused on the locations that would have enough of a story that would a, a, fit into the sort of theme of transformation, but also have enough variety and interest in there to kind of, to keep it, I suppose, to keep people listening. Yeah, and good stories to tell. Like, so the club scene is is particularly effective, right? Because you've got the clubs are really kind of fundamental to Berlin's kind of um, uh, perception as a, a, a as a as a tourist destination. The all night long aspect. There's a kind of will you won't you get in? If anyone's been standing in a queue in Bergheim, they might know that they might kind of empathise with that. Uh, and then you've also got the fact that it's actually there's quite there's a lot more than that. There's a really interesting story behind there of the government looking at those clubs in a in a very different way than the UK or maybe an American government might look at nightclubs and actually has given them tax breaks and really incentives to be there. So there's a kind of business angle on it as well. And there's there's on that one then. So for example, in that music example you can speak to like the doorman, you can speak to the DJ, you can speak to people in the queue. Is any of this acted? Or are all of these people, all genuine people, genuinely in the queue, the genuine doorman, an actual DJ, are all of these, re- I know it's a documentary, but is any of this kind of acted out or is all of this kind of real people? It's 100% real. Yeah, it wouldn't work if it was acted. I mean, that would be really unauthentic. Yeah. I mean, In fact, I don't think we've ever considered having anything acted. It's wow. quite funny you say that. That's just it. But I think I think well, the thing was is because I said I was listening to it earlier on, and everyone's fairly sort of well spoken. There's not the typical, you know, murmurings that you might get. Even I do this, you know, I'm hosting the podcast and I go uh, mm, all the time. So everyone's quite well spoken. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't necessarily that I was thinking it was scripted, but it's 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 of that kind of quality that it kind of that just question popped into my head. Do you know what I mean? That's editing, I think, Kane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe something to do a bit more of that. <laughs> so, okay then. So was there anything else from a design perspective that you think would be useful for, for people listening? I mean, we've touched on a few things and, and this is a unique design challenge because it isn't just, you know, a, a quick fire kind of game and it's not sort of a transactional thing. It is, as you mentioned at the start, Nikki, a, a, it's uncharted territory for, for voice, long form documentary style audio it is, a, is a, a a new sort of ground. Is there anything else from a design? I know Nigel's itching to come and speak about the technical stuff. So before we kind of move on, is there anything else from a design perspective that you think would be useful for people to learn about? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh the questions. So, uh, uh, like we said earlier, there was no sort of, inter- well, we tried not to have interaction for interaction's sake, but we also had, there's multiple ways that you could phrase the questions in, in this um, project. And we tested out uh, how different questions would fall with that audience. Um, we had some sort of more playful, uh, interrogative questions that um, didn't test as well. Um, but yeah, so how you phrase the questions and then, also, how Caroline, because, you know, she she is a radio presenter in Berlin, so she's not an actor. Uh, she's got a very real voice, but she's used to talking and uh, she's used to talking to people. So she was actually a brilliant uh, choice in the end. We did test a sort of more formal um, actor's voice and, and people felt like that sounded too much like Siri. So she, you know, the way she phrased the questions as well. So I would write all the questions out for her, but she could change them uh, as long as the kind of, there were key things that she said, she could phrase them differently to make them feel more natural. So that was another part of the design process that I 
uh, that sort of was uncovered for me, like how you write the questions, how you voice the questions, um, how you test the questions. And then um, another key part of the design, which was sort of taken from other projects I've I've done and, and we've all done um, in the interactive space is, is just iteration and user testing. So I would go in uh, with different stages of the project into the FT offices and sit with their readers and go through the experience with them um, and test and see how they responded, see what they liked, what they didn't like, how they spoke to the assistant, what they expected to hear back, which parts of the content um, sections they liked, where, you know, what, what they wanted to do essentially. And a few other kind of key things came out of that user testing, which was the ability to to quickly move from one location to another. So if you were not interested in the club's set section, you could easily get out and move to another one. And that was a bit of design that came in through the process. Um, and this will actually play well into Nigel talking, but a, a really uh, a big key part of the design process as well was the prototype. So. Um, this was something new for, for all of us, uh, including the FT and Google. So we spent a lot of time constructing the uh, one section, so which was the clubs, um, and building that out into um, a prototype that we could test, but also we could also find out what worked technically uh, was two minutes too long to listen, did we need to make it shorter, were the questions interesting, um, and also our internal production process because you're working with hundreds of files of audio. Um, so how do you manage that? How do you manage iterating? How do you manage script changes? How do you manage, um, you know, using the technology platform we have to use? How, do you, how are we going to all work together to make that process really smooth? And that all came out of learnings from the prototype yeah i, I think um that the the alpha that that we built was very much um hands-on what can we do with the technology um and, and what limitations does that um does that give to the design um and you know finding clever ways of of working around it so we could get that rich content in there that we wanted um uh, but um you know still uh actually be able to create the thing technically hmm. so did you go into this having an understanding of what you could create technically first of all or was the alpha essentially trying to take the 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 prototype and, and the design and, and trying to just bring that to life essentially straight away well, we'd we'd used um, myself. Uh, I'd, I'd used uh, Dialogue Flow and done some work um, quite a few months previously on you know what, what can we get out of this, but to a fairly basic level. Um, the, our approach to to this was to take what we'd previously done and try and get as as many features into uh, the alpha that, that that we possibly could, um, but without going overboard. Um, so what we did is we took one of the areas, or sorry, say one of the nine locations, uh, it was the clubbing area, and we created that manually in dialogue flow um, by creating you know, individual intents that followed on from each other um, with a little bit of error fallback. Um, uh, and, and that gave us the, the basic you know, idea of, of yes, we can we, we can achieve what we want, um, and we'll research some of the more advanced work, some some of the more advanced features that that, that we needed. Was this using the, just the text to speech audio at this point, or were you using dummy audio, or had you actually gone out and recorded all the stuff at this point? Uh, so for the for the prototype, we. Um, we, we wrote a script, so based on uh, research that Barney and his team had done, uh, we wrote a script and then we got, or they got uh, people to voice it. So we just had, uh, you know, average people reading out uh, from a script so we could get the audio clips. And then we had Nikki actually doing all the, uh, the Caroline uh, interaction questions. Okay, so you, so you had something to work with then, Nigel? Yeah, well, I mean, we initially um, put the script in, uh, you know, as the uh, as the text to speech, and then replaced that with the audio uh, manually as we went along. 
uh, and that's that's where um, we we realise that it's actually really tricky um, trying to get a piece of audio from someone, make sure it's named the right thing, uh, put it into dialogue flow, uh, link it up in dialogue flow, uh, and then you know go and preview it, and then adjust things and drop other versions of audio in, and this something. We realised that that was uh, as a manual process was actually quite complex to do. And um, we needed a, 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 to, to, to hit the target of the, um, uh, the release, we needed a lot more streamlined way of being able to do that. Mm. So what, what, was the, what was the plan from then on then? Well, uh, uh, dialogue flow um, isn't necessarily the easiest of things to work with when you're trying to build a complex interaction. Um, so one of the first things that we did was to see how could we automate dialogue flow? Uh, how could we find a way of getting all of this information, all of these uh, areas, all of these locations, um, uh, and and piece them all together somehow and automatically generate that um, to go into dialogue flow? Uh, and one of the first pieces of research we did was whether we could generate exactly what we did for the alpha um, programmatically. Uh, and that's that's one of the first things we did. And we managed to reproduce the alpha 100%. And then we started to build on that with extra things. So the, the way that we realized we had to do that was to build a, a fairly simple uh, content management system. So you could, you could uh, link all of your uh, different locations, all of the areas within the locations together. Um, you could put in all of your uh, text-to-speech content, you know, your placeholder um uh script uh and then we you can replace that with proper audio by going to an audio upload page and filling in different audio slots that would all get uploaded into the cms uh and um we basically just hit build and off it went and then we could test so our build turnaround uh was about about a minute um so building the whole thing uh, using uh, Firebase Cloud functions uh, to being able to test it uh, live uh, on a Google Assistant device. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, we, we didn't think we were going to get that, that fast a turnaround at all. And Nigel, am I understanding correctly that you are sending the, the response payload back directly from Dialogflow, or did you have some code that was handling that fulfillment of the request. Right, so um, it's probably worthwhile going into a little bit of the, uh, the, the what we did with Firebase, um, because that that will sort of expand on that area. So uh, because we were in purely in the Google space, uh, it, it made perfect sense for us to use Google Firebase for everything. So we used it for authentication um, of, of different users using the CMS. The hosting of the CMS itself, which is a single page uh, web app, uh, all of the database functionality, um, storage for audio files, and also image files, because we used images as well in this, uh, which we'll talk about later, I think. Uh, and then uh, using cloud functions, uh, both for the build process, uh, also audio conversion we did uh, using cloud functions as well. Uh, and uh, yes, we used um, cloud functions for uh, dialogue flow fulfillment as well. So we started off with um, only creating the dialogue flow intent data. It wasn't until we needed to do more sophisticated things that we started to build our uh, fulfillment uh, logic behind that. Um, and uh, that, you know, we, we reached certain points where, oh, we want to do this clever thing now, or we can't with dialogue flow just on its own. We need to be able to do a little bit of extra logic. So that's that's where the that's where the fulfillment really came in. Where were some of those places where you were really pushing up against the edge of dialogue flow's capabilities? Yeah, well, uh, dialogue flow um, isn't really built for for what we've used it for. Um, essentially. Uh, it, it it wants to go from one intent to another to another to another. Um, whereas some of what we were doing, we wanted to stay within the same, shall we say, cluster 
of um, intents for one area. So, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, for each for each point that you get to on the map, you have essentially two pieces of audio. You've got one which is the the, the documentary content, um, and then you've got another one which is Caroline's voice. We wanted the user to be able to hear both of those in succession, uh, but also they could skip past the documentary part and go straight to Caroline's audio. So, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to react to a skip command so that it would take you just to the question. Um, as well as that, you've got fallbacks. Uh, you, you, you might want to repeat back to the beginning of the question as well. So we end up with a, a cluster of about six or seven uh, related intents for every uh, every point on the map that you're on. Um, and that that we felt was something that was really pushing uh, dialogue flow <laughs> to, to to its max, really. Um, you, if you move that further forwards, uh, we, we then start to add in uh, help functionality um, and the ability to jump from wherever you are in in one area to the beginning of another area. Um, and uh, this is where you know we, we start to use more of the fulfillment side of things. Um, to keep track of whereabouts the user has been. Um, and um, as, as was mentioned earlier, the, the, the string of pearls where you've got this, this circular navigation. If you've jumped straight in at, let's say, area four, and then you've gone out, and then you've come back in area three, uh, because we're aiming to go one, two, three, four, five. Uh, if you're at three and you've already been to four, if you say move on from three, you'll jump to five. So we needed to be able to build that logic into it as well. Um, uh, and uh, again, that's where the fulfillment uh, really helped us to, to do that. And so you're relying on user storage there to, to know where the user has been and, and where you need to route them in the future. That's right, that's right. So um, uh, storing off um, you know, each area that they visited and all the different points within the, the areas as well. And that was useful when they returned back, we would give them uh, a rough percentage of how far through the whole experience they were, um, which, which was nice feedback for them. Yeah, something that is really interesting to me here is it sounds like you now got a C CMS that you can build these actions very quickly on. If you wanted to do hidden cities, 20 other cities, it seems like your workflow now would be a lot faster. Is that something that you would recommend for all voice developers to think about early on? Or is that like where you ran into those problems and you needed something to make the work easier? Yeah, I mean, we, we identified at quite an early stage that uh, this would be something that would be reusable, not just for um, you know, the exact fit of hidden cities, but uh, certainly adaptable by us uh, for, for a whole variety of, of, of different voice applications. Um, and I think Nikki's probably got a few um, uh, bits to mention on this. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's really exciting. This is what we're really excited about because we have this CMS now. And, you know, sure, I don't think the opportunity to do Hidden Cities Japan and, hidden, you know, Hidden Cities Tokyo is quite right because... The partnership with the Financial Times and, and it was just really about that one that one incident. But we, you know, if anybody else was looking to explore um, creating content in, in a similar way, then we'd love to partner with them and we'd love to say, you know, look, come and come and use our services or come if you want people to do the whole thing and make the content, then we'd, we'd obviously love to do that too. And I think what we've got is not just the technology, but the expertise in delivering this kind of rich content uh, and thoughtful UX, and you know, uh, which I think is really unique. Um, so we're really hopeful that other other brands uh, are interested in in exploring this space too. Come and speak to us. Indeed, absolutely. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic for you to join us, and Nigel. Before we before we head off, you you were going to say something about images and handling. Yes, images. I was just thinking we left that as a loose end. Um, okay, so uh, we, we were asked um, for uh, some of the visual devices that you've got, so the, the, the Google Home and obviously any smartphone that's got the Google Assistant on uh, have displays. Um, so um, we, we were asked to see what we could do with that. So we used a basic card um, slot 
for the response, uh, and we had the ability to put, uh, you know, title, subtitle, an image, and uh, some text on there. Uh, the the images, uh, Nikki. Again, I've got to refer to you. Where, whereabouts did the images come through for this? Because they, they were absolutely fantastic. Oh, um, so sorry, oh, Michelle. Okay. Um, so actually, that was um, a, a, an FT photographer. Uh, went to Berlin and went to the various um, places that we had identified as stories. Um, and this was done quite late in the process, so we already knew who we were uh, featuring um, as characters and which locations we were featuring as well. So we, we got them commissioned specially, or the FT commissioned them specially for the experience. And then, um, yeah, Nigel built that into the CMS and so I could upload them. Wicked. Wow, well... For something that is, they always say that the sign of good design is when it appears to be almost like it's just seamless and there's no design involved, if that makes sense. The sign of a good website is something that you just don't know is it just lets you crack on and do what you need to do sort of thing. And that's probably the biggest compliment I could pay is that the, today when I was trying it, and I tried it again last week, and I don't, I never even thought about the, all this stuff that you've been thinking about hopping between locations and remembering where someone had been before and clustering in tents into one. Lo- never even considered any of that. I was just happy just cracking on, going through, just sort of listening and enjoying it. So it's absolutely fantastic. Boys and girls, do check it out. And where can people, well, they'll know where to find it because I'll put the links to, to this particular action in the show notes. But if people did want to reach out and, and work with you in future, where's the best place for them to go? They could just contact Nikki, N-I-C-K-Y, at rosina.io, um, or you can just have a look at the website, rosina.io, and I can put you in touch with Nigel and Michelle directly if you're inter- more interested in speaking to them um, instead. But, yeah, please do. I, I think the other thing I want to say, excuse the piano in the background. Um, my daughter's doing Mamma Mia on piano. Um <laughs> The other thing is is also if people have any feedback, I think we're really interested in, in hearing that and particularly people who have come from, who work in the voice space or exploring that because I'm really interested to hear what people think about it but what else people want to do in this space because it's a really, it's a really good opportunity to change how we access entertainment and our media and I really want to connect with people who are interested in exploring. Um, so not just if you want to work with us but also if you just want to talk about what you're doing and, and you want some you know, you want to meet other like-minded people, do get in touch. Fantastic. Nikki, Michelle, Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. That's been fantastic, that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That was Nikki Birch, Michelle Feuerlicht and Nigel James Brown. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. That was such an immense discussion. I tell you, for something that when you listen to it and you're interacting with it, seems seamless it really does check it out hidden cities berlin um but to listen to and understand just how much complexity was involved certainly on the technical side having to bypass dialogue flow and create a standalone cms just to get what they need to from it and then to think about how all of the upfront design work that goes into it and how yes in some instances it's similar to writing a, a documentary but at the same time it needs to be interactive so understanding how to construct the narrative and how to design the experience is absolutely fantastic i love the idea of using that circular pearl necklace as nikki called it that's a a really unique way of visualizing the experience in terms of you can go to any pearl at any point in time or jump into the experience at a particular pearl but then the track kind of goes round and you, you you're on the path so to speak once you start really 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 refreshing and and Obviously, you know, Michelle, BAFTA winner, Nigel, two times BAFTA winner, Nikki's worked on voice for the past two years, got some really good examples of some good voice experiences, loads of experience in radio and, and all that kind of thing. So the, the, these three people are literally at the top of that tree when it comes to creating immersive audio experiences. So it's no wonder that it's been so good, but there's plenty of stuff in there that we can all learn from. And I hope that was as valuable for you as it was for me and for Dustin. Thank you again, Nikki, Michelle and Nigel and Dustin, of course. And as always, boys and girls, thank you all for listening. Until next time, see you later.